Welcome to Geo Interesting, presented by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Recently, author and journalist Yudijit Bhattacharjee visited the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Springfield, Virginia campus and told the story of Ryan Regan, a former signals intelligence officer who stole over 20,000 pieces of classified information. Yudija was able to sit down with us and answer some questions. But first, let's listen to a part of his talk at NGA. So Brian Regan worked at the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, which, as you know, is, is, uh, is the agency that manages all of the spy satellites that the US has in space. He was assigned to the agency in 1995 after about 15 years in the Air Force. He was a signals analyst, and he had worked as a signals analyst uh, during, the f during the first Gulf War. And by virtue of having top secret clearance, he also had access to Intel Link, which is, as you know, which is the intelligence community's version of the internet. So there's a reason why you haven't heard the story of Brian Regan. Uh, maybe some of you have, but his story remains sort of largely untold. And the reason is that he got arrested just two weeks before 911, uh, and and his story got completely overshadowed. And so, despite being the first spy since the Rosenbergs, who were executed in 1953, uh, despite being the first spy since them to become a candidate for the death penalty, uh, he he remains largely an unknown figure. Uh, well, we'll change that in just a, just a bit. Regan's story is anything but typical. He was able to elude and stump authorities long after he was caught due to his nearly unbreakable code. This is not just a story of code breaking and espionage, but also the human side of Regan. Stay tuned for Geo Interesting. So today you visited uh, NGA to speak to our workforce about your new book coming out. Uh, what sparked your interest in this topic? I was fascinated. I've always been fascinated by the insider threat. I've written a few espionage stories, real-life espionage stories, over the years. Um, but when I heard about the Brian Regan case, it was already six years past the conviction of Brian Regan. And I thought that his story was already well-known, and it was only I that didn't know it. But it turns out that because Brian Regan was arrested shortly before 9-1-1, and he was convicted shortly after the American invasion of Iraq in 2003, that his story sort of remains largely unknown. And so I found it fascinating that he had used all of these codes to hide the secrets that he had stolen. So there was sort of a an intrinsic mystery aspect to the story, you know, beyond just the spy hunt itself. Uh, but then what really got my attention was the fact that he had made all these spelling errors. And, you know, he seemed both so cunning and so inept at the same time. Uh, and that made him a fascinating character to study. And as a journalist, I, I love to... Uh, study complex characters. It was really during like the first part of how you uh, described that the FBI was able to make like a preliminary list of you know who they thought was committing espionage against the U.S. Could you go into that? In the book, I describe all of the digital forensics that they did uh, in order to kind of develop a list of suspects. What Brian Regan had done in these anonymous letters that he had sent to uh, various embassies at the time. It was only known that he, uh, that the sender of these letters, who, who was anonymous at the time, had, had sent it to the Libyan consulate. Uh, and the letters included certain printouts of satellite images and a few uh, top-secret reports that had been derived from Intellink. And so uh, it was, those were the clues that were initially the most important. 
Uh, but there was also kind of a parallel effort to psychologically profile the, the traitor behind the letters. And so there was a convergence in these two investigation uh, avenues, investigative avenues, to, uh, to ultimately settle on Brian Regan. And so could you talk a little bit about what, you know, some of his uh, reasons for committing this crime was? So his, his main reason was financial trouble. Uh, he was in dire straits because of his uh, severe debt. You know, he had something like $130,000 in, in debt, most of it from credit cards. Um, he was also very worried that he wasn't, he wasn't going to have a means of earning a living once he retired from the Air Force, and his retirement was coming up in the year 2000. He had joined the Air Force in 1980. He had risen to the rank of Master Sergeant, uh, and he was going to retire at that rank. And so he had tried to get an extension for himself, um, he could have received an extension if he had agreed to be deployed overseas, but he didn't want to dislocate his family, and so his request was denied. And I think that is the point at which Brian Regan felt a perfect storm in his life and decided that he needed to do something. Um, well, he decided that he was going to commit espionage because he had access to all of these secrets. He thought it would be relatively easy to steal them and then find a buyer among uh, some of these countries that he planned to target. Now, there was a deeper reason for Brian Regan to do what he did. Um, throughout his life, Brian Regan had suffered a lot of disrespect and humiliation uh, because of his dyslexia and because of his odd personality. A lot of his co-workers, a lot of his friends in high school and middle school, um, they thought that Brian Regan was not very smart. They thought he was just this strange, odd person who wasn't very bright. And Brian Regan had a deep desire to show that that wasn't the case. And I think that that played a role in... Uh, in making him go down the path of treason. What would you ask him if you had 10 minutes alone with him? What would, what is one question that you just want, you know, would want his true answer from? I would want to know why he didn't find a friend to talk to. Because I feel like that's the one thing that could have saved him. Mm -hmm. And I think I know the answer to that. I think Right from childhood, Brian Regan saw the world as an adversary. He did not see the world as a kind place uh, that might lend him a helping hand. He thought he had to fend for himself. You know, when he was a kid, he came from a large family. He, had, he came from a family of eight brothers and sisters. And uh, he used to kind of put a padlock on his closet uh, to to kind of hide all the Pop-Tarts and things, you know, snacks that he had collected because he didn't want his brothers to rifle through his, uh, his snacks. And so he just felt like he had to, uh, you know, he, he had developed this notion of self-reliance, that he needed to do everything by himself. He needed to fix his own problems. And I think that is something that a lot of, servicemen and service women will identify with. Uh, that's, you know, that's that's pretty standard. Uh, and, you know, we live in a culture where self-reliance is seen as a sign of strength and you're not supposed to reach out for help. But Brian Regan had every reason to reach out for help. He should have been reaching out for help as soon as his credit card started mounting. He should have gone to see a financial counselor. You know, he should have talked to his supervisor. He should have talked to a couple of his co-workers and said, will I really get a job when I retire? What am I going to do? Because I, I believe that he made the decision to commit espionage at a time when he was extremely worried about whether he would get a job 
you know, at the end of August 2000 when he was supposed to retire. Uh, so that's the one question I would ask him. And then, of course, there'd be many others. <laughs> yeah. Um, so after studying him in the case for so long, um, what could have been one thing or one scenario or one instance or moment that he could have gotten away with it? Or do you even think there is a moment that maybe if he hadn't slipped up that he could have gotten away with it? Or was it all foiled from the beginning? I think that Brian Regan might have gotten away with it if he had, you know, if if his letters had reached the hands of an astute intelligence officer in the Libyan service or in the Iraqi service. And if that, you know, handler had done some background uh, investigation on Brian and decided and, and, and determined how to handle him, I think they might have, you know, struck up a good partnership, uh, you know, much to the misfortune of the United States. I think that was possible. But I can see many ways in which Brian Regan, uh, you know, would have, you know, would have made other errors <laughs> because Brian Regan certainly had a tendency to make some key errors despite of like meticulous planning, you know, like he's so smart, so smart. And then suddenly, you know, he leaves the door open, you know, that sort of that sort of stupidity was ingrained in him. Uh, I shouldn't call it stupidity, but but that kind of tendency to blunder mm -hmm. at key moments. Um, so he was he was a pioneer in many respects because he was the first person to realize that all of this digital access to secrets could be exploited in this way. I mean, that's the same thing that Snowden and Manning did years later maybe not for the precise same purposes, but, you know, they, they did use their digital access too. Um, and so I've lost my train of thought, but, but he, you know, he, he, would have, uh, he would have probably slipped up in some other ways. Um, and, you know, but maybe he would have slipped up well after the damage was done. And so it really is a, is a testament to the dedication of uh, Special Agent Steve Carr of the FBI and his fellow agents, and also agents from inside of the NRO who worked so hard for so many months to, uh, to, to, to catch him and then to unearth the secrets that he had buried. So how do you pick what interests you in your writing, or does... It just interests you, and you write about it. Well, I, uh, you know, I'm I'm sort of uh, I'm just a curious person, and what I'm most curious about is human psychology. I think because you know humans are masters of deception. You know, human beings can be so noble, and they can be so cruel. I mean, it's just fascinating that all of these traits lie inside of us, you know, some dormant, some active. Um, but obviously when I go out into the world to look for stories, you know, I, I go looking for stories in areas that I know a few things about or, um, you know, in areas that I have some access to people who know about those areas. So I was a reporter at Science Magazine for many years uh, until I, um, I left to write this book. And while at Science, I just, you know, I, I was able to write stories about neuroscience, astronomy, uh, science and security, and other topics connected to scientific research. Uh, and in the course of pursuing those stories, I would come across human stories that had a kernel of science or a kernel of technology. And then the human story would sort of become the more dominant thing that I was after. But of course, those stories would not work if I didn't also report on the science. So it's really the meld of 
humanity and scientific and technological enterprise. Uh, that's sort of the the area that most interests me and seems to be the the most uh, you know fertile ground to uh, to till. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Too Interesting is produced by the NGA Office of Corporate Communications. Never miss an episode by subscribing on SoundCloud or iTunes. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and visit us at www.nga.mil. Thanks for listening.